The road to rebel-controlled eastern Libya leads from Egypt, both literally and figuratively. We sent reporters Willem Marx and Inigo Gilmore into Libya to try and explain how this revolt differs from the others that have swept the region. Libya, Libya, freedom! They headed into Benghazi, Libya's suddenly famous second largest city, to meet the men and women who are rising to challenge Gaddafi's rule after more than 40 years of brutal suppression. For centuries, Benghazi has served as an important port for multiple empires. And if the citizens here have their way, it will be the birthplace of a new Libya. The reminders of Gaddafi's Libya are everywhere, and the people here are eager to be rid of them. We came across a bonfire fueled by little pamphlets. These are the notorious green books that outline Gaddafi's ruling philosophy. They were required reading for all Libyans. Wherever you look, there are signs of protest. Here, a tent becomes a gallery for handwritten pleas. And painted murals have sprung up that are far from subtle. In these respects, what is happening in Libya looks quite similar to what has taken place in other Arab countries. But then there are scenes like this. Welcome to basic training for the new rebel army. In a Benghazi schoolyard, the volunteer warriors get rudimentary instruction from trained officers who have recently defected from Gaddafi's Libyan army. It isn't hard to find those who are eager to fight, but there's a shortage of weapons and experienced military leaders. It's not easy to build an army overnight, and frustration levels are high. One young man we first met lining up in formation was eager to vent his impatience when the drill was over. One of the staging areas for rebel troops heading to the front lines is a burnt out building down by the port. There's a bleak irony to the fact that this is now a home base for the rebellion. Just a few weeks ago, it was the headquarters for Gaddafi's secret police. 30-year-old Nadir Mazik is from Benghazi, and he says everyone here feared this building as a place where people would be taken never to return. The family, family, friend, very sad. One of his friends died here. And he says now is the time for payback. A month ago, Manzik was a bodybuilding coach. Today, he wears a uniform and waits for his orders to head into battle. Inside the building, Manzik led us down to the charred basement in order to explain why he and so many others are determined to fight. This room, look. This, he said, was a torture chamber. The local population torched the place in anger when the rebellion began. Mazik recounted the horrors inflicted by the secret police in these rooms. In another room, Marzik flipped through files that had survived the fire. He said they were records of prisoners held here, evidence of an institutionalized terror. I'm very, very angry. And, and I, when I come in here, very angry, and I need to kill the Gaddafi now. Because from, for people, for Dead, dead people here. There are few certainties about what is taking place in Libya now, but one thing is clear, many more people will die. Early one morning, we joined Marzik as he headed west to a town that the rebels had held the day before after a fierce fight. I'm going to the Serbia because they're my friend. 
my fr brothers and friends. And after, go fight to the Gaddafi in the Tripoli. We passed a rebel army checkpoint on the edge of town. On the side of the road, a young fighter scanned the skies with an aged anti-aircraft gun. Traffic flowed normally inside the town, past portraits of Gaddafi that had been torn down from government buildings. Marzik took us to the local hospital, where he greeted a fellow soldier who says he was wounded by shrapnel. In the children's ward, two young brothers were being treated for head wounds, they say, were the result of ricocheting bullets shot by Gaddafi forces. This is shot him in the kids, in the head, in the face. Why? Why? Their father sat in shock on the bed. The gunfire had claimed a third son's life. Next door to the hospital is the morgue. A van parked outside was full of bodies, including that of the third son. Mozik joined the crowd of mourners that had gathered in a mood that was both angry and sad. Many looking on were relatives of the dead. And this man, father, is dead. Mozik says the world needs to pay attention to every one of these deaths, proof of Gaddafi's willingness to murder his own people. Back in Benghazi, a group of young men paint the old Libyan flag on a building downtown. It has become the emblem for the uprising. The flag is everywhere, and so are the colors, red, black, and green. For weeks now, the people of Benghazi have gathered every afternoon by the water in a show of solidarity. Not just men, but women and children, lots of children. The atmosphere is part carnival, part political rally. The passion is unquestionable, but looming over everything here is a haunting question. Can all this emotion form the basis for a new country? This is a scene that was never seen in Libya. Essam Gariani is one of the senior advisors to the new so-called National Council, a provisional government that the rebels have just established in Benghazi. It is different from any other Arab country. It is a country that had no institutions whatsoever, and that what makes our revolution special, and that what makes our task very difficult. Gariani is popular with the young protesters. A psychologist by profession who trained at Michigan State University, he's become a respected elder statesman in a revolution that's only a few weeks old. Gariani has joined a small group of intellectuals who are busy drafting a new constitution. But first, they have to win the war, if they can, against Gaddafi. The main and our utmost priority is the downfall of the regime is the downfall of the regime. This is the most important thing for us now in order to put an end to the bloodshed that is taking place in all the towns that he still has some partial control over. So the bloody battles continue. And for now, no one can predict how this all will end. For the Gaddafi regime, for the thousands of rebel soldiers like Nadir Marzik, and for the men and women who hope to lead a new Libya. But in Benghazi, the feeling is that the risks they've taken are worth it. You know what? I am so excited about what's happening in Libya, and I am so happy that I lived those past couple weeks, that even if I die tomorrow, I feel that I have lived the most enjoyable moments in my life over in the past two weeks. Definitely.
Green book. Green book. We came across a bonfire fueled by little pamphlets. These are the notorious green books that outline Gaddafi's ruling philosophy. They were required reading who were rising to challenge Gaddafi's rule after more than 40 years of brutal suppression. For centuries, Benghazi has served as an important port for multiple empires. And if the citizens... The road to rebel-controlled eastern Libya leads from Egypt, both literally and figuratively. We sent reporters Willem Marx and Inigo Gilmore into Libya to try and explain how this revolt differs from the others that have swept the region. Libya, Libya, freedom! They headed into Benghazi, Libya's suddenly famous second largest city. To meet the men and women here have their way, it will be the birthplace of a new Libya. The reminders of Gaddafi's Libya are everywhere, and the people here are eager to be rid of them. 